Thank you very much for joining us back at our session, uh, Diaspora Futures. Uh, today, we're being joined by Safifwe Baleka, founder of Balanta Borusa History and Genealogy Society in America, the coordinator of the 8th Pan-African Congress, the chairman, strategy and research committee, West Africa region of the Pan-African Federalist Movement, and a member of the International Network of Scholars and Act Activists for African Reparations. And so with that brief introduction, I wanna say welcome to Safiwe Baleka. Welcome, thank you very much for joining us today. Abene, thank you in my Balanta native language. Uh, Abene, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Safiwe. You know, um, we had a chance to meet at the International Decade for People of African Descent. And we also had a chance to talk about diaspora futures and black futures, African futures. Um, give us your um, thoughts and your pulse of where you see that discussion going? So overall, generally, um, I see evidence that more and more of our people are waking up and we're moving in the right direction and that we are developing the stomach necessary to achieve real independence and liberation, both on the continent and in the diaspora. Um, you know, such a project historically costs sacrifice and blood and sweat and tears. Um, and we're living in an age where there's a lot of creature comfort. There is sophisticated psychological operations that have us in a modern neo-colonial mental um, prison, um, but we are seeing evidence and signs that those prison bars are being broken, um, you know, especially particularly, for example, in the West African Sahel region, uh, certain places in the diaspora where um, we see resistance, you know, for example, in Atlanta, Cop City. Um, so, you know, the veteran Pan-Africanists, um, throughout history have always said that victory is ours, it will be ours, um, and that justice will prevail and we will prevail no matter how long it takes. Um, I know as a younger man, and even now, I might not have the patience to wait another, you know, 20 years, let alone another century. And so, so many of us are getting to that point where we realize, no, in our lifetime now. So generally speaking, um, uh, I feel good about, about the trajectory of our struggle. Yeah, you know, one of the things you, you uh, well, a couple of things you mentioned, but um, we'll go to the generational comment about in my lifetime now. So we've had some representatives from Canada who are roughly their second generation um, Black immigrant Canadians, they're roughly in their 50 year age span. And as a result of being you know, led to believe that Canada was their salvation, those 50 year olds are now wondering, is that all there is and was, and why am I here? And so then now they're getting that new reawakening. And there's a whole new movement in Canada, which I'm getting the sense and experiencing that that's happening within the diaspora and also where you are located as well. Um, you're in Burkina Faso, is that correct? No, I'm in uh, Guinea-Bissau. Guinea-Bissau. Yeah, so in the capital city of Bissau. Okay, so in Guinea-Bissau, and I, I'm sorry, I was just thinking that West African Sahel region, so I'm sorry, but you, you mentioned that people are getting woke in that region, and, and tell us what you kind of feel what woke is for that. Like, is that through the use of technology? Is that and it, I guess it's got to be right because you got to spread the word quickly. What what are you seeing in that? So first, let me start by saying I, I happen to be the research and strategy um, head for the Pan African Federalist Movement West Africa region. So it's my job to kind of research and come up with strategies on how um, this per the sixteen countries in this region. Um, can move towards a federal United African States. So all of the things that we're seeing going on in the region, you know, most recently with um, um, Niger, 
And earlier you had Burkina Faso, you had Mali, um, and then even a little further south, not necessarily in our region, you have Gabon, which is a different weather. But at least in Niger and um, Mali and Burkina Faso, getting woke in that, um, in those um, situations, in those territories means people are understanding the nuances in different kinds of coups, um, that there can be a constitutional coup where imperialists or enemies of the people use constitutional means to take over or retain power. Um, and so part of being woke is understanding that and then responding to it from the point of view that sovereignty rests with the people. And so um, if you have, let's say just bad leaders, neo-colonial puppet leaders, people whose practices and policies and leaderships aren't benefiting the people, who proclaim or project that they have the constitution or quote unquote law on their side, the people, particularly the younger generation are saying, uh, no, you have to have the will of the people on your side. And if you misuse or abuse the constitution to stay in power, or if you rig elections um, and it's, you know, the, neo-colonial political um, status quo, we are no longer gonna tolerate it. And there are people that are showing that um, they can harness, use, coordinate, mobilize military power in those territories to take control and the people are supporting it. So they're becoming um, popular movements. Now, um, what will be the result will, time will tell and remains uh, to be seen whether or not the military takeovers lead to um, a system, a government control that does a better job in meeting the needs of the people. Hmm. Yeah, you know, we, we were talking about that with um, Chandran Nair. He's in Hong Kong and he wrote a book called Dismantling Global White Privilege. And we were speaking a little bit earlier on that. And one of the things that um, we were talking about, and I think you and I briefly talked about it, was the, um, the multi-unification of countries mm -hmm. to strengthen themselves. And we just most recently saw that with uh, some of the most recent countries that have experienced a coup. Um, what, what, do you, what do you see on that? And, and what's your uh, future uh, projection on where that might go? So... I think we were talking specifically about the defense agreement pact that was made between Mali, Niger, Burkina Faso. Um, so to me, that is a prime example of what I call mutualizing sovereignty, which is an important and necessary step in reaching some form of continental government that is a sovereign power that is able to harness all the resources of African people, both at home and abroad, um, so that we can take our rightful place in the global world order and be truly free and independent and sovereign. So this is an example, you know, I'm, I'm excited about it, but I'm cautious, I'm not overly optimistic, but it is a good teaching moment. It's illustrative of this mutualizing sovereignty principle that um, I like to explain it this way. The 55 member states of the African Union, individually, none of them have the power for um, being completely responsible for all aspects of their sovereignty. There are issues that um, the individual nations themselves just aren't strong enough, powerful enough, they just don't have the capacity. So in this particular case, defense needs, you know, Niger alone or Burkina Faso alone or Mali alone does not have the military capability to 
um, defend itself against more powerful uh, nations, whether it be France, the European Union, NATO, the United States, Russia, India, ch uh, China, okay? So as a small nation, when you understand that, you're going to need these kind of agreements, these kind of alliances, whereby you are mutualizing a particular aspect of your sovereign responsibility so that um, as it's some sort of federation, you can meet that responsibility. This, this is necessary, not just when it comes to military um, um, issues, you have monetary issues, currency issues, um, scientific issues, environmental and climate issues that no one small nation can meet independent of itself. So I see this um, um, mutual defense alliance pact as an example for the entire African continent to say an inventory needs to be taken on what are the other sovereign responsibilities that most nations cannot meet individually and how do we mutualize them into a united African states uh, some sort of federation that does have the sovereign power to then use the resources of Africa, in this case, it would be soldiers, to negotiate um, defense uh, uh, contracts so that we have the military equipment that is needed, you know, whether it be aircraft, drones, um, nuclear weapons, who knows, whatever it is, um, that the continent or sub-regions of the con con uh, a continent need in order to make a stand like this to completely break from the neo-colonial structure. Uh, so this is, this is an example, right? We should be looking what other kinds of alliances and agreements, federations can we make like this regionally and continentally that will lead to a, a United African States. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I say that, and I said that, um, you know, I'm, excited but not overly optimistic because I know that one, achieving the dream of Garvey, of Nkrumah, of the committed Pan-Africanists who understood that without a united Africa and her people, we will never be respected in the world. And without a, united, a sovereign united African continental government, um, we won't have the capacity to harness our resources and respond in a way that is independent of the neocolonial structure. That that process um, requires a strong people's movement where people truly understand that the sovereignty that governments exercise is really on loan to those governments it's given by the consent of the people. So for example, the Pan-African Federalist Movement has a campaign where it will be calling for a United African States, um, a first Congress that will eventually um, hold referendums throughout Africa in each African country and allow the people to tell their leaders if in fact that's what they want, the mutualization of aspects of sovereignty that can't be met by individual states into a federated United African states. So that's gonna require a mass mobilization, ma you know, educating the people uh, of Africa, those um, at home and those abroad into a tremendous mass movement. Um, and whether or not we are able to use the momentum from the recent events to fuel such a, a campaign is ultimately going to be the litmus test on um, that determines what exactly these events that we're witnessing in the West African Sahel region, the meaning of them. Mm -hmm. That will be the litmus test. You know, you've got the International Decade for People of African Descent um, insignia behind you. And we have been looking at diaspora for, uh, futures 
and the diaspora as being identified in the UN International Decade for People of African Descent, we're seeing a groundswell of connectivity um, amongst the three largest groupings of, of Black people of the diaspora, right? We're seeing Brazil and Black Americans in Africa organizing in such a way, but still yet being separate. And you talked about the sovereign responsibility and the social contract. The sovereign, yes. con the sovereign responsibility to me is a interpretation of the social contract. I agree, yes. And so, and so at the end, we were talking, I was in a meeting with UNDP earlier and we were talking about education, for example. And the UNDP HBCU team was basically saying, oh, we're gonna educate and provide, you know, 50 to 100 fellowships and scholarships for Africans. And I interjected and said, yeah, but the need is 100 million. <laughs> you know, you're, you're just doing 50 and 100. How long is, how long is it gonna take 250 years? You know, and so we need new structures to come out of this sovereign responsibility, this new wokeness, this new identity, this new technology age. And I guess for you, my question is, as being a participant of the international decade, how do you see these three large groups of the diaspora working together in the future? Or do you see it working in the future? Well, first, let me let me start with the UN itself. Um, as you know, I work closely with Her Excellency Ambassador Erikana Chibombori Pau, the former AU ambassador to the US, who is very outspoken about uh, and uncompromising um, about breaking with all of the post Berlin Conference neocolonial structures. And recently, you know, I, I'm I'm the coordinator for the Eighth Pan African Congress Part One um, that she has called and that is um, in development. And recently, uh, Her Excellency gave a speech and she said, you know, African countries need to just leave the UN. It's not for us. It's not by us. It's not for us. We have no need to be there. We need to just disengage from the United Nations. And I'm starting to um, agree with her. For me, the, the, the engagement with the United Nations is on right now is on its kind of last breath, at least for me. It's an academic exercise where, um, for example, through PFAD, um, the Permanent Forum of People of African Descent, um, you know, I took the position that this organ should, if it's going to be called in our name, people of African descent, we need to see if it's going to be accountable to civil society, the people of African descent, or it's going to be accountable to whoever set it up. And the litmus test was um, requesting the advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. That was something within the PFAD mandate that they could do yesterday. It would have uh, it squarely puts the diaspora, and you asked about the diaspora working together, the different diasporas. It squarely puts the diaspora, um, and particularly the historical diaspora, um, fundamental legal questions that we need answered to know if we can expect justice at the highest court on the planet. The ICJ is an organ of the United Nations, unlike the International Criminal Court, which is an independent private um, system. Um, it has a different mandate, jurisdiction, and all of that. The International Court of Justice is a United Nations organ. And so me, I just wanted to accelerate, fast forward to the ultimate question. For the first time in history, have this independent court of justice answer the fundamental questions um, that will let us know if our claims will be substantiated. 
because there's no other higher court on the planet. There's no intergalactic court where if we don't get justice at the, at the ICJ that we can appeal to like aliens from outer space and say, hey, okay, humans on earth um, uh, uh, are either unable or unwilling to protect human rights and provide justice at the highest level. So therefore we need to appeal to our highest. There is no highest jurisdiction. The highest jurisdiction is natural law, okay? So I just wanted to fast forward and force them to state their position. And then we will know whether or not it's worth our time to even continue to engage. For me, this was the last kind of test. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, to me, it doesn't matter if the African Union gets a seat on the Security Council, right, and becomes the, or the G21, right? You have no power there. You're still outvoted. You're still, you have a seat at the table, but we're not looking for a seat at anybody's table anymore, okay? Now, to your question about the different diasporas, just so I'm clear, what, what three diasporas are you referring to? Well, I was only saying the largest core group of Black people. Okay. Being those in Brazil, the United States, and on the continent of Africa. That's what I was Okay. Okay. And then I was so, actually looking for a common working future or whether we can work together and our futures linked. Absolutely, yes. The answer is yes. Um, not only is our futures linked, um, nobody at this junction should have any doubt about that, as if all of our great heroes and sheroes didn't already tell us this. <laughs> Right. Marcus Garvey told us this, um, you know, uh, uh, Malcolm X told us this and Kruma told us this. Um, I don't have to call every single name. This is a this is not an academic. This is not open for debate anymore. Every right thinking African person on the planet ought to know in the information age by now that it is only in the consciousness that black people on this planet right, have suffered oppression from a system of white supremacy, regardless of your nationality, your culture, your religion or whatever, because you are black, you have suffered under a particular system. And if you don't have that consciousness to understand that therefore we need some kind of black pan-African unity in order to throw off the yoke of that system, I don't know what to tell you at this point. What can we possibly say that hasn't been said already? Who doesn't have access to the information? If you don't know, it's because you don't want to know. Now, so the answer is yes. It's a it's 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 a fundamental principle of uh, requirement, and yes, all of us in the diaspora on the continent we can work together because there's enough information out there for us to understand why, and enough people are. Um, organizing and mobilizing in their, their, their territories, their specific silos. They're doing the same work with the same agenda. And now those links, those networks, those as uh, associations, it's almost like a brain and a neural network, right? Where this, the, 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 neuro, uh, uh, the nerve endings and the um, synapses, they're all connecting now. And information is jumping rapidly across and networks and trust and relationship and ideas and strategies and tactics are, are being coordinated at an accelerated rate. And even though there are certain um, issues and problems because of different levels of uh, consciousness or development or um, particular regional um, environmental concerns, uh, I don't believe any of the hype that you know, that um, that we can't work together, that there's such a great gap between continental Africans and Africans in the diaspora, uh, the historic diaspora, the continental diaspora. I'm not buying into that divide and conquer um, narrative at mm. all. Mm. You mentioned the 8th Pan-African Congress, and I think I mentioned to you uh, the work of the late Reverend Leon Sullivan, Yes, and you had the Sullivan summits, and I think I shared with you a link to it today because I played it, usually play it at the beginning of my day because it was so invigorating for me. I, I attended two of his summit meetings. One was in Gabon, 
and I stayed at the hotel that Michael Jackson stayed at. That was the claim of fame, you know. Okay. <laughs> that was the Akume Palace. And then I was also in Senegal covering the uh, summit meeting for an African magazine called African Profiles. And then, of course, I went to the war in Sierra Leone and I did some more war correspondence. But I say all that to say there is some in relationship to the 8th Pan-African Congress. Do you see that as being similar to what the late Reverend Sullivan was putting together and what he was attempting to do? And then secondly, um, how can people um, assist you in any type of coordination that that may be? And even myself, because I, I, I also want to continue and, and contribute, because I want to see another African, African-American summit happening in Africa? Well, if the one of the aims and objectives of Reverend Sullivan's project and the events and the, the summits that he was holding was to build real working relationships between African Americans um, and people on the African continent, social, cultural, business, um, if that was the aim, then yes, the series of Pan-African Congresses that are coming up, um, the Pan-African movement in general, um, they are one and the same, okay? Um, how that's pursued, what networks are the primary points of contacts, all of that will change because 250 million people in the African diaspora and how many, you know, what is it? 1.3, 4, 5 billion on the African continent. I don't know. Of course, we're going to have different contacts, different networks and uh, how we move forward in that, you know, that's just outward cosmetic appearance. In substance, yes, I think they're all the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then to your question, so one of the things that everyone can do one of the um, tactical um, things that we need to do, organize and unify the African Union as a sixth region, you know, organize the African diaspora as the sixth region of the African Union on equal footing of the other five regions. So that um, one, the diaspora is can leverage its own resources and power towards its own agendas that it sets with the help of African governments. Okay, that is the agenda of the Eighth Pan-African Congress Part One, which was originally supposed to happen in last October. It got postponed. We talked about having having it in January of this year, then that got postponed. Then we said April of this year, and that got postponed. Then we were saying November of this year, it's been postponed. Now we're looking at early 2024. Um, now, everything happens for a reason and in its season, and nobody should be discouraged the fact that maybe you're not hearing so much about the 8th Pan-African Congress Part 1, uh, or that it's been postponed. This is in fact standard. This happened with the 6th Pan-African Congress, the 7th Pan-African Congress, the dueling 8th Pan-African Congresses of 2014-15. It's the nature of organizing a momentous event like this on the African continent with African governments that have their own particular bureaucratic and social challenges. It's standard, it's par for the course. It will happen. It has a limited objective. And we can, one thing that we can achieve with the 8th Pan-African Congress Part 1 is having an AU 6th region headquarters with 10 to 15 representatives to go to the AU Permanent Representatives Committee, which is where all of this stuff happens, where, you know, whether it's getting a glass of water, a toilet, an economic program, whatever it all starts and ends through the PRC. And right now we don't, we're not represented there, even though you have this Article 3Q amendment that invited us 20 years ago this year, right, to be, uh, you know, full participants in the building of the African Union and the continent. So the thing that people can do right now is, if we can demonstrate 
that the Eighth Pan-African Congress Part One is a Congress that is truly representative of all sections of the African diaspora, right? Meaning North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, Europe, Middle East, Asia Pacific, Australia, and anywhere else that I may have missed. If a credible number of delegates from each area attends, English speaking, French speaking, Spanish speaking, Portuguese speaking, and that they participate in sort of the preparatory meetings. We've had six or seven of them now that have had great participation. There will be a new calendar with more in-person and virtual events um, that will be released as soon as um, it's finalized. Uh, I know about this because I'm the coordinator. I've been working on it with Her Excellency and government heads of state. Um, but in the meantime, there's a link that shows what the conference agenda is and an endorsement form. And our goal is to get a mere 100,000 people in the African diaspora to endorse the agenda. 100,000 people out of 250 million in the diaspora is a drop in the bucket. But no Pan-African Congress has ever had such documented support. And this is what we will have behind us, giving us credibility saying, not only was there a thousand or 5,000 delegates that attended the Congress, that a hundred thousand people in the diaspora were aware of the agenda, supported it and participated in the meetings. So I will give you that link. And we want everyone to endorse it and just spread the, the link, make it go viral. And this will help speed up the organizing process and you know, get the final dates established and get the harmonization from certain heads of state, other Pan-African or organizations that um, are also hosting events. We wanna harmonize them into a single agenda and behind the scenes that's happening. But right now the people, can just sign this form. It's, it takes 30 seconds. It's your name, your email. There might be one or two, your location, where, where do you, mm -hmm. you know, what country you live in. But if we could get 100,000 of these, we will have um, sort of effort, you know, civil diaspora civil society will have done its part. Well, I want to mention, I've got about 20,000 people in my network. So as long as it's e-signable, I'm happy to send it out, okay? Yep. I know sometimes the document may not be, but if it's e-signable, actually, actually, it's a it's a it's a link to um, a, a web page, mm -hmm. and it's a form, right? You just fill it out right on the web page. That's Good. it. Good. Okay. So we tried to make it as easy as possible. I'll make sure I do that. One of the other things, um, I started going to Africa, I think, in the 1990s when I mentioned uh, Reverend Leon Sullivan's meeting in Gabon. I think that was the first time that I went to Africa. And I went with, you know, Minister Farrakhan, Jesse Jackson, the who's who of black leadership, black elected officials across this country. But the thing that I didn't see once I began to live there and look behind the curtain was that in some African countries, it's one gynecologist for every 20 million people, or it's not even a, a mental health worker or a psychiatrist for every 300 million people. And yet I do not see the the call from the African continent to say, hey, you educated people in the diaspora, we need your mental capacity, we need your expertise, we cannot pay you the $2.5 million you're earning in the United States, but we can grant you a sustainable wage, a sustainable income where you can still live and exist, and yet you can help us. And I just don't see that coming. And I wanted to know mm -hmm. um, what you think about that, or and, you know, why do you think that hasn't happened yet? So the call has been and is there. It's part of the whole Article Three AU Sixth Region concept coming out of the African Union, and so therefore the member states itself. Um, so it's there. But it hasn't been actualized in substance. This is what I think you're getting to. And part of the reason is 
um, or let's put it this way. What is needed is for these African states who know they can benefit from the diaspora's expertise and experience to lay the foundation, which is you have to provide citizenship, right? Visa-free entry. We have to, you have to establish a unique immigration status for us so that we aren't treated like any other foreigners coming into, because we're not foreigners, we're the lost sons and daughters of the continent coming home. We don't want to be treated as business partners. We need to be treated as who we are, the descendants of prisoners of war who never relinquished their domicile, hence their birth and burial rights in Africa, right? They need to come forward and say, here's our preferential treatment uh, platform policy legislation where you can come, you can be citizen, right? You have preferential business uh, uh, um, status because we know we can't pay you a salary that you can command in the first world. And so therefore you need to be able to come in and do business unencumbered so that you can pay yourself. And if we don't set up that kind of relationship where um, any kind of international contract goes to you as the diaspora first, and it only goes outside of the diaspora if after three months or six months, it can't be fulfilled. Mm. So we need these kinds of things. We need um, all, all of the barriers to setting up a business, You know, the residency requirements, the language, all of that stuff has to be waived, even the fees. And this will then signal to the diaspora that we really are respected, that they really do want us. And then we will use our own resources to come because many of us want to leave out of the West. We have that consciousness already. Um, and we just need the barriers removed. Mm. Um, the people, most of the people on the continent understand this. Why the leadership? Again, we have the wrong kind of neo-colonial um, leadership. It's a generational thing too. Um, and I think this is gonna be changing, but we have to do our part. We have to make it easy for them to be able to engage the diaspora by having a one-stop high council governing structure for the AU sixth region, which has already been proposed and is part of the Pan-African Congress agendas. We have to actualize that. Um, we need to make it easy so that they have a one-stop shop to go to. There's a contract, there's a project that needs to be done. Bam, you go to the AU6 Region High Council. It goes into the database. Every diaspora person registered in the database who fits that profile is notified. And then there is a system, an institution, a mechanism for us to communicate the needs and be responsive with the appropriate um, technical expertise that is latent in the diaspora. Mm. And so now all we need are visionary technocrats who can build that platform using our own social media like uh, Michael Thompson's OBT, um, um, uh, um, Backroom. Uh, we have our own blockchain scientists um, that can take care of, you know, 250 million registration and security needs. We just need all of those visionaries to come together, decide on what the platform is going to be, launch it, um, and then let the African states say, we've done our part, you do yours. No, I like that. And you definitely touched me when you said the visionary technocrats because that's what we're all about here at the African-American Future Society. So we're very happy with that. Um, and we're very hopeful. And, and what I mean by that, some of these things are low hanging fruit and we just need to have the overall media platform to actualize it. For example, I remember years ago, they used to have the Come Back to Jamaica advertisement. Yes. And you may remember that because it was amazing. Yes. yes. <laughs> that is so simple to put together. And, and, and this is not to cut you, but just to let, this is exactly what Ghana did. A lot of people heard about Ghana's year of return in 2019. Mm -hmm. But what they don't know was that 
In 2003, the Economic Commission for Africa had did all these studies on what they called the brain drain. Mm -hmm. And then they were saying, how do we come up with a brain gain? And they hit upon a kind of cultural heritage tourism to woo the diaspora to come to Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay, So they did all these economic studies. And Ghana was the only nation that read them, took them seriously, and developed a five-year plan. This was in 2003. So you have 2004, five, uh, 2003, four, five, six, seven. 2007 would be the end of this five-year plan. Ghana invested in infrastructure, tourism infrastructure, particularly for the diaspora. They trained people in hospitality. Um, they they put resources into you know the the slave tourism uh, infrastructure. They had a robust five year plan, and then they launched Operation Joseph Project. Joseph Project was the 2007 forerunner to the 2019 year of return. 2007 was the 50 50 year anniversary of Ghana's independence. And it was also the 200 year anniversary of Britain's abolition of the slave trade in 1807. So they had the 2007 was like this banner year. You had all of this, you know, chronological historical uh, signifiers on which to build a campaign around. 2007 was a great success. All these people came in. Ghana at that time also hosted what was called the Grand Debate on the United States of Africa in honor of uh, Kwame Nkrumah and his legacy. I was there at the Grand Debate. I witnessed myself this Heritage Tourism Joseph Project campaign. And the success of that really is what gave Ghana the confidence to see the, 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 the potential of the year of return. And so the president of Ghana at that time, he took three trips to the West, where as a statesman, he invited the diaspora to come back. The, you're absolutely right. This kind of marketing campaign at the African Union level and at the country level is exactly what's needed. Uh, uh, you know, modeled on the smile Jamaica, come back to Jamaica. Uh, um, you know, we need a jingle, we need a commercial, and we need the, the, the commitment. Uh, for example, here in Guinea-Bissau, we have the Decade of Return program, which I created with the Ministry of Tourism. Now, we've had to do all the marketing on our side. The Ministry of Tourism has yet to really take ownership, create its own marketing materials, or invest in the infrastructure that we need. Because for example, here in Guinea-Bissau, they don't speak English. They only speak Portuguese. So if they don't tr train English speakers who can serve as guides for the, 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 the Balanta descendants, the Fula descendants, the Jola descendants, so we as, you know, for example, our Balanta Society, you had mentioned, you know, I'm the president in the opening, we've had to do our own private initiative. We're, we've set up a school, we're opening next month, it's an English language training school um, that will not only um, help Bissau Guineans learn how to speak English, which will give them certain opportunities, but we're specifically training them so that they can be hosts and guides for the African-American descendants of Guinea-Bissau who are coming in greater numbers here because you can't move throughout the country without them because we need interpreters. So um, I, I, I'm glad that this is a topic that has come up because you're right. If we don't have such marketing campaigns funded by the various ministries of tourism and cultures on the continent, there's no real evidence um, that they want it to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I love what you said. Um, we've got about 10 minutes. Okay. Um, one of our speakers named Chandran Nair was talking about, he wrote that book, Dismantling Global White Privilege, was talking about how language can destroy you. It can just take away everything you were and make you someone else you're not. And at the end of the day, I've got a relationship with a company that does the uh, earplug translations. 
such that as you've seen in some of these sci-fi movies, people put a thing mm -hmm. in front of their mouth and they can automatically translate in real time. I don't see in mm -hmm. the future the types of translational needs we see at the United Nations, like for some of the African descent meetings, there was not a Portuguese translator. So therefore the Portuguese weren't included, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I just say, mm -hmm. I just say in essence, I want to help you with uh, the, well, I want to help the continent getting these translational earplugs at a super reduced rate. Because again, I don't want cost to be a prohibitor of being able to communicate you know, um, amongst anyone, right? Um, that's one of the things. You know, this is... Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, this is fascinating. Um, and I'm getting a message. My internet is becoming a little... Yeah, I saw it. I saw it. So Go hopefully ahead. In, these, in these 10 minutes, we'll be okay. Um, and you bring up a really fascinating point, which is I think we can harness technology and especially future technology um, as well as traditional language learning to solve Africa's language problem. Uh, we need to solve it for a number of current and, and you know, practical reasons. Um, um, and I could foresee technology being the primary answer, you know, if, mm. if it was cost affordable and every, and just like pretty much everybody in Africa has a cell phone today, mm -hmm. if everybody literally had uh, 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 through their cell phone or through an earpiece or whatever it is, you could just speak. And in real time, you hear. I know that technology exists already, but it's not, you know, everybody doesn't have it, but it, at least it exists. Because there's talk about, you know, making Kiswahili the lingua franca of the continent. I'm not a, I'm a big fan of having a lingua franca of the continent. I'm not a big fan of Kiswahili because to me, it's still a compromised language where there's still, um, you know, contradictions in terms of it not being 100% African indigenous, you know, so me, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, but what I do foresee in the future is using the kind of technology that you mentioned having that integrated into the educational system where everybody is learning one particular African language, where it can, because of the technology, everybody can be taught it from preschool, you know, through college. Mm -hmm. And it will be the educational lingua franca. But at the same time, as someone who is deeply involved in transgenerational epigenetic effects and cutting edge research, I understand that there's a particular genetic value to preserving our indigenous languages because um, epigenetic science teaches us that the matrix through which our experiences are encoded take place through one, the electromagnetic signature of the environment and to the language. And so therefore, if you ever lose the language, and there are many ways to lose it. For example, me and you, we lost it through the through ethnocide, state-sanctioned ethnocide committed by the United States government over eight generations. So me and you, we can't really speak our ancestral language, the language that your ancestor, the one that survived the Middle Passage, that language. And so for six, seven, eight generations, that vibration that activates encoded knowledge, it's like genetic memory in the same way that we have muscle memory, mm. right? When you lose the, the, the key, you've lost access to that encoded genetic memory that has been there for tens and hundreds of thousands of years. So on the African continent, I'm educating them to say, look, there's a value to the language that transcends economic value. There's a genetic value that we're now really just discovering. So if you don't value preserving your language, you're gonna lose it. We as the diaspora, those of us who long to recover that ancestral tongue that we have, we, we serve as a catalyst 
as a, a multivitamin, encouraging them, know your language has value. Don't spend all your time learning English and French in the colonial language because you want a better economic opportunity in the, in the global world order. If you're going to learn those languages, at least now as a stepping stone, you can only do so by preserving your indigenous language because you can never lose that. You never want to lose that encoding key. Um, so I think technology is going to play a great role in, in simultaneously solving both aspects of the language problem. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, um, just want to say hats off to you. Great work that you're doing. I want to say thank you very much for participating in our session today. This will be recorded and sent to you for wide distribution. And again, um, Safiwe Peleka, I want to say thank you very much and hope to see you soon. You bet, Yul, it's a pleasure. You know, I've attended a few of your events now. I look forward to, to doing more of them. Um, and sometime when we get a chance, we should have a segment where we talk about the future role of melanin. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Cheers, my brother. See you soon. All right, take care. Okay, bye.